Hi guys, welcome to another video presentation for my blog, wargamesreview.blogspot.com. This is an example of combat from the game Field of Glory, which is a miniatures tabletop war game. You may have noticed several months ago I put a video on my channel that is a simulated combat where I explain my first game and how it worked. After doing that I thought it'd be a good idea to review just one individual battle to showcase how the combat mechanism works in Field of Glory. As I've said before, my background is I've played Warhammer Fantasy Battles and this is the first historical war game I've ever switched to. And the two combat mechanisms are very different. So let's take a moment to review one here today. We're going to do a simulated battle here. And in this simulated battle, uh, we have uh, a group of knights on the charge. They are English knights, and to be a little more specific, they're taken from the source book Oath of Fealty, and they're from the list called Middle Plantagenet English. Plantagenet English, I believe is how it's pronounced. And <laughs> Sorry if I did mispronounce that to any of my English friends. Uh, their technical classification is Feudal Knights and Sergeants and they'll be the red. So anytime you hear me say English or Knights or Red, that's what I'm talking about. They have some characteristics. They're classified as Knights in the game. No surprise there. They're heavily armored. They're superior, which means they need to and get to reroll any failed ones on the two hit rolls. They're Lancers because they have Lancers and they are Swordsmen. We'll go into more detail on what that means later. The group they'll be charging are the French, and they'll be blue, uh, also from the same source book, Oath of Fealty, under the list Feudal French. And the technical classification for this unit is Infantry with Mixed Weapons. Uh, many times a Field of Glory, for the sake of simplicity, uh, they'll take a mixed weapon battalion and make it one classification. Because in a real historical battle, the odds of every single troop in a unit having the exact same weapon is unlikely. Most likely, a couple had an axe, a couple had a halberd, uh, several had swords. Since the majority had swords, they're going to classify them as swordsmen. They have some characteristics. They are medium foot, meaning they're not the heaviest infantry, they're not the lightest, they're somewhere in the middle. They're protected, meaning they have some armor, but not a lot. Frankly, the guy in the picture here is probably a little too heavily armored. Oh, and by the way, throughout this presentation, I do um, use a lot of images that have not really a technical matchup with the units we're representing. Those are just for fun. They're considered average, which means they do not get to re-roll uh, any ones or twos. But on the flip side, they don't have to re-roll successful sixes, which if they were considered poor, they would. So they're just in the middle. And they are also classified as swordsmen. Now the first thing we'll look at is the impact phase. So the knights have the active turn, meaning they're the player that's doing the primary actions right now and they have their knights charge into the infantry swordsmen. While they could flee, let's just say for the sake of this uh, battle or combat example, they hold. First we need to discuss points of advantage, which essentially when you're looking at any sort of combat in Field of Glory is who has the advantage in this particular situation. In impact, you would assume knights heavily armored with lances would do very well. That's kind of their specialty. Just think historically of the glorious charge of the knights. The English get one advantage simply for being classified as a knightly lance. Yes, they're knights. Yes, they have lances. And it is in the impact phase. That's one point of advantage there. The English have another point of advantage when mounted troops charge medium or light foot troops. There are some exceptions, but in this particular case, that is a point of advantage. So, that's a net double advantage for the English, which the game represents as a double plus sign. Note that you can never have more than a double advantage, so even if there were three points of advantage, you would still only utilize two at most. Now in the impact phase, there's two dice per base in standard contact. And when I say, when I say standard contact, I mean uh, flush 
forward to forward contact. In other words, the two diagonal touches don't count. The English have a double advantage, so they need a three or more. And they roll a four and a five, and a five and a six. So that's pretty good. They got all four hit. The French need five or more. And the logic here is that if it was a break even, both sides would need fours. If it was a single advantage, the advantage side would need a four, the disadvantage side would need a five. If there's a double advantage, the side with the advantage needs a three. The side with the disadvantage still needs a five. So let's see what the French roll. They get a three, and a two, and a six, and a five. So they got two hits, the English got four, so obviously the English win by two. Now the French are going to have to take a cohesion test with some modifiers. A cohesion test is, you know, what we think of in Warhammer as a break test. If you lose combat, there's a chance something bad will happen. One of the modifiers is that they took at least one hit for every three bases in close combat. Obviously they took four hits, so really, even if they had had 12 bases, that still would have applied. In this case they had eight, so that does apply. They also get a negative one, or that is one bad modifier, for having at least two more hits received than inflicted. And you'll see these two come up a lot in this. They also have uh, one negative modifier from a section of the rules that says any one of. In other words, there's going to be four or five things listed. If any of them apply, there's one more modifier, but not cumulative. One of the things in that category is any troop losing impact combat versus lancers. Again, all these things just kind of make sense. Historically speaking, if you lost in an impact, if you were charged by knights and you had a fairly bad showing, that's a bad thing, so that's a modifier. Total modifiers, negative three. And I'll explain in the next slide what that means. Now, normally you need a seven or more to pass your cohesion test, but those modifiers are gonna come into play and make that roll three worse than it normally is. In other words, in this case, the French need a 10 or more to pass, which, statistically speaking, isn't that likely, because on two die six, they'll have to roll uh, 10, 11, or 12. In this case, they roll exactly 10, so they do pass. Uh, good news there for the French. Now, moving on here, they also have to take what's called a death roll. And this is not just to check your morale, but to see, did you lose enough men to actually remove a base for gameplay purposes? For death rolls, you should score higher than the number of hits received or lose a base. There's a plus two modifier to the side that wins or if it's a draw. In other words, the English won't need to test this turn at all. Because even if they roll a one, they add two, they're going to roll a total of three. Well, they only had two losses, so they're going to win no matter what. No point in the English testing. The French don't get that modifier because they're the side that lost. They didn't win, they didn't draw, they lost. So they just need a straight up more than four. They roll a two, so they will in fact lose one base. And there you see it disappeared from the graphic down below. Moving on to the maneuver phase, uh, this is the turn where normally you would be moving around any troops that aren't involved in combat and doing a few other things, but for the sake of what we're showing here, we're going to talk about something called feeding bases into an existing combat. In this case, the knights are going to move uh, one of their bases from the back row to the front row. The reason for this will be obvious later, but just to sum it up, I'll say the way knights fight in the melee phase. Um, they can only fight with the troops in their front row, so it makes sense for them to move if there's any advantage to doing so. You can only do it when there is an advantage. Uh, just as I said, they expand their frontage by one, moving one base from the rear rank to the front. Now we need to talk about points of advantage in the melee. This will be similar to impact, but not identical. There's going to be one point of advantage to the English for having better armor. This makes sense, and a more protect 
protracted combat, which melee represents. Melee is the ongoing combat. Having better armor will give you an advantage. Both sides have the swordsman skill, but that actually cancels out. In other words, um, if you have it and I have it, we just don't count it. It's a uh, cancel out and just stick with the single advantage that the English have. Now the knights uh, do need two dice, or rather get to roll two dice per base in front row contact, or six die. And there it shows you why it made sense to move a knight from the back row to the front, because that back middle guy can't fight now. You can only do one feeding of a base into an existing combat, otherwise it would have made more sense for the knight to do both. Six dice for the knights. Most troops, including the infantry swordsmen, get one dice per base in the first or second row, including the overlap position. The overlap position is when you only have the diagonals touching, such as the base on the front right of the French. So seven dice for the French. Now the English have a single advantage, so they're going to need a four up. And they roll like this. That's a pretty crummy roll. They only got two hits. But, oh, look, there's some ones in there. Remember, the English are superior. They get to re-roll their ones. So on that re-roll, they get three, three, four. Well, only one more hit, but hey, we should take it. The French need a five or more because of that single advantage. Not as bad as last time. Not the three to five, but it is four on five. They get to roll seven. They like to roll theirs all at once, apparently. Ugh, pretty crummy roll there. Look at all those threes. They get one hit. So, three to one. The English win by two, obviously. Now, the French are going to have to take a cohesion test with modifiers similar to last time. We still have a modifier of taking at least one hit per three bases in close combat, because they took three hits, which would have applied to anything up to and including nine bases. They have fewer than that. They do have a modifier for having two more hits received than inflicted, one to three. And they have one that is testing for losing close combat versus mounted troops in the open. That's a rule that specifically applies to medium foot. They're not uh, stalwart enough like the heavy foot would be to not have to have that bad modifier. Total modifiers, therefore, negative three. Now the French are going to need a 7 or more, modified by negative 3 to pass, same as last time by chance. In other words, a 10 or more. This time their roll is a little more average, they get an 8. Uh, which, after taking down the negative 3 modifier, is 5, so they did not get 7 or more. Now the French swordmen are disrupted. And what that means is their morale is not as good as it was. This will come into play later in terms of how they perform in future melees. Doesn't mean they're on the verge of running, but they've, they're have they not steady anymore. They've gone down one notch from the best possible status in morale or cohesion to the second best, or I don't know if second best is really a way of saying it. Basically the middle <laughs> for not fleeing. And I'll demonstrate that, or represent that by having a little skull symbol uh, on the graphic here. Now they still have to do a death roll. They need to score higher than the number of hits received or lose a base. Remember they took three hits, so they need more than three. They roll exactly three, which is not enough because death rolls are not an equal to proposition. It's a more than proposition. So they do lose another base. Look at the bottom left-hand corner. One disappeared. They're down to six bases. You can kind of see where this is going for the French. It's not looking too good. All right, so it's the French's turn. Now, there's not going to be an impact combat. Those only occur once ever. So we're going to go to their maneuver phase. The English are going to expand their French by one to match an existing overlap, just like they did before. So now all the English are in the front row, all the knights. They're going to get the full strength of the knights fighting. In this French turn melee, same as before, knights two dice per base in front row contact. Since they're all in the front row now, eight total die. Any other troop, um, one dice per base in the first row or second row, including overlap, that's six die. But, remember in the last combat they were disrupted? 
the French are going to lose one die per three bases due to being disrupted. So in other words, you count off base one, two, three, remove that third dice, base four, five, six, remove that sixth dice. Now they're down to only four die to roll. So you're kind of getting the impression here about how winning combats in one turn really gives you advantage in the subsequent turns. Or maybe a better way of saying it is losing combat really hurts in subsequent turns, both in cohesion and the death roll. Death roll means less guys to fight, fewer dice. Bad cohesion means you have to exclude certain die. Now the point of advantage is going to be the same from here on for the rest of the game. So just remember it's always the English Knights single advantage because they have better armor. That's the only one that applies. The Knights are going to need a 4 up. Now from here, you know, for a while, I'm not going to do the graphics with the dice coming in the side. I got kind of sick of adding those one by one. I apologize. Uh, they roll 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 4, 2. That's a lot of twos and ones. Uh, they get to re-roll their three ones, and that comes with five four for two more hits. In other words, the original four rolled plus the five four on the re-roll, three hits. That's actually a below average, obviously, but eh, take what you can get, I suppose. The swordsmen are going to need five or more. They're going to roll two one two five for one hit. So once again, the French lose by two. Excuse me. Uh, just reminding you, the Knights won by two, the French are going to take a cohesion test. It's worse than last time. The same three modifiers we had before apply, and in addition to that, they're going to have to have a negative one for having taken 25% or more losses overall. So now down to four modifiers. And, as if that wasn't bad enough, being disrupted in and of itself is a modifier when taking a cohesion test. So in this case, negative five total modifiers. Good luck to the French. Now the French are going to need a seven or more modified by five. Five, uh, the bad way, and of course in this situation bad is adding to your roll to pass. In other words, they're going to need 12 or boxcars to pass. They roll them up and get a five, six. Oh, so close, but just not quite. So the French swordsmen are now fragmented. We're going to add another skull here to the graphic. And what that means is this is the lowest ranking you can get and still be in combat, not being forced to flee. So they are in bad shape. I don't know if you've ever played the game uh, Medieval Total War or Medieval 2 Total War uh, on your computer, but you know if you have guys fighting and you'll hover over them while they're fighting, sometimes it'll say something like, uh, they're excited because they're winning, or they're on the verge of crushing their opponents, but if you're losing, it'll say uh, the tide is turning against them, or, you know, about to flee because <laughs> they're losing badly and their morale is dropping. Well, that's that's kind of what fragmented is. And there's a picture showing uh, the knights are really starting to whoop up there, just for fun. Now the French still need to take a death roll. Uh, they need more than three to pass. They roll four in this particular turn, so no base lost this turn. Well, at the very least, even though they're fragmented, they didn't have to lose any more men. All right, now back to the English active turn. No impact, really nothing to do in maneuver. Uh, so we're gonna go straight to melee. The knights are the same as before, eight dice. The French get one dice per base, both rows, but now they lose one dice per two bases instead of one per three due to being fragmented. So essentially when you're fragmented, you're down to half your bases, so they're only going to get three. Now the points of advantage are exactly the same, English with a single advantage. The Knights are going to need a four up. They roll six, five, six, one, three, six, five, two. That re-roll comes up to three, so no more hits, but better this time. Five hits. The swordsman are going to need a five up and roll four, three, six, one hit. Things are not looking good for the French. The knights won by four this time. All right, we got to look at the cohesion test. It's worse than last time. We had five modifiers last time, but... On this test, they're fragmented, not just disrupted. That's a negative two, whereas a disrupted was only a negative one. Now, it's not 
cumulative use the worst of the two. So instead of negative 5, which included the disrupted, they're fragmented, which is negative 2, so it's going to be total modifiers of negative 6. Now the friends are going to need a 7 or more modified by negative 6 to pass. In other words, they're going to need a 13 or more on a 2 die 6 roll to pass, which of course is impossible to do. Oh, hey, looky there. Ah, that's my little attempt at war game humor. Feel free to groan. The French, of course, are broken. So we're going to add a little skull down there to show that they're broken. Now you're probably thinking if you're broken, you run away, and that's true. But we still have to do the death rolls before the potential fleeing begins. The French took five hits, so they're going to need more than five. They roll a 1. Sorry about that. Cut it off there. Uh, they did lose a base, as you can see in the graphic. Um, they're down to 3 of their original 8 being deceased. Alright, so we're on the initial route move now, and the first thing we need to describe is how the variable move distance works. Essentially, first we'll talk about the normal move. Swordsmen are medium foot. Normally they would move 4. What variable move distance means is that can be increased or de decreased on a flee or pursue based on a roll of a 1 die 6. If you roll a 3 or a 4, you move just like normal. If you roll a 2, you move 1 inch less than normal. If you roll a 1, you move 2 inches less than normal. If you roll a 5, you roll 1 inch more than normal. And if you roll a 6, you move 2 inches more than normal. So 3 and 4 are normal. Uh, one periphery outside that, in other words, 2 and 5 are a little more or a little less. A 1 or a 6 is a lot more or a lot less. Just to demonstrate the unpredictable nature of fleeing, so on and so forth. Uh, the swordsman roll a 4. So that's a normal move. Their flee will be 4 inches. Just repeating what we had last time, the swordsman fleeing four. The knights are classified as knights. Big surprise. <laughs> so they normally move four as well. And some people have said, really? Knights the same as a guy on foot? A medium infantryman? Well, in this game, yes. Uh, the thought process there is they're cumbered down, lots of armor. There's probably barding on the horse. They don't really move that quickly over open terrain. Maybe at the last few seconds of the charge, they really pick up pace. But in terms of you know, actual giving chase, you know, they're slow to get started. Whatever, that's the rule. So we'll, we'll roll with it, of course. Uh, they roll a two. Now that reduces your normal move by one, so the swordsman will pursue three. In other words, the French are going to get away this turn. So get rid of that graphic, and that's what it's going to look like after the fling. They should end up exactly one inch apart. Now, we've seen the full example of combat, and we're not really going to talk any more about subsequent actions in terms of a diagram or anything, but there's a couple ways this game could go, uh, as we got a beautiful Templar charge here showing the victorious knights about to pursue their French foe who are uh, retreating the field. Um, the English could decide in their next turn to charge them while they're fleeing. Um, you know, if they are able to make contact and you contact a broken troop, they don't automatically die, but they do automatically lose a base. In that example, the French would be down to four bases. They would be auto-broken. In other words, depending on the quality of the troop, every troop can only sustain so many losses before they're auto-broken. In other words, they just are removed from the field of play because they're so scattered they can't possibly reorganize as a battalion. Uh, in the case of the troops we had here, if they lost 40% or more, um, so they only had to lose one more base, they would have been auto-broken. On the other hand, the French could possibly rally, but you would have to bring a commander over to make base-to-base -base contact with them, do some rolling, and score well enough that they start climbing back up that ladder. They'd go from broken to fragmented, fragmented, disrupted, hopefully disrupted back to steady. If you can get them at least to fragmented, they'll stay on the table. That's not all that likely because there's going to be modifiers in play, and we'll save that for another discussion. I think probably the thing that would be most likely is 
that the English knights would turn their attention somewhere else in the field, because most likely, eventually, those French swords were going to run off the field anyway. But we'll save that for another discussion at another time in terms of subsequent actions that could happen. Now let's talk about just a few key concepts we learned about here from Field of Glory's battles. Points of advantage, basically asking what is an advantage in this situation when you have troop A against troop B, who has an advantage, if any. An example would be better armor or having lances on a charge, things that just logically make sense from a historical point of view. If there's no advantage, both sides get to roll fours. If there's a single advantage, the side with the advantage needs a four up, the side with the disadvantage needs a five up. And if there's a double advantage, the side with the advantage needs a three up, the side with the disadvantage needs a five up. And there's never better than a net double advantage. Another key concept is cohesion tests. Certain things make you more likely to become disrupted, fragmented, or broken when you lose combat. For example, if you take two more hits received than afflicted, that's a negative one modifier, which makes your dice roll have to be higher, less likely to succeed. Generally, you need a seven or more on two die six to pass with the modifiers. You only test when losing combat. There's a few other times of the game where you test, test as well, but for the sake of what we learned today, you only test when losing combat. The winner does not have to take a cohesion test. We also learned about battle group deterioration, and that's just the official way of saying falling down the cohesion ladder, going from steady to disrupted, disrupted to fragmented, fragmented to broken, so on and so forth. You start as steady, which is normal. If you're disrupted, when you're fighting in your next close combat, you lose one dice per three bases. If you're fragmented in your next close combat, you'll lose one dice per two bases. And if you're broken, you must flee if you're not already auto-broken by then. I put etc. because it's a little more complicated than that, but we didn't get into it in today's lesson. And then the final concept we'll think about is death rolls. You have to roll higher than the number of hits received or lose a base, so obviously the winner wants to do as much hitting as possible. You always get to add two to your death roll if you won or drew combat. In the example that we had, the English never took more than two hits from the French, so they never realistically had to take a death roll. The effects of these things become cumulative, and by these things I mean the last three things we talked about. Um, the cohesion tests, the battle group deterioration, and the death rolls. So the main thing to take away from that is don't lose combats. We saw the whole idea uh, that's presented in Field of Glory is essentially you know, when you f lose your first combat, not that big of a deal, but the second one's worse, the next one's even worse, and it's sort of like a ball rolling downhill. Frankly, I think it probably represents the historical concept of combat better than the, you know, for every guy you lose, pluck one guy off a base, and, you know, eventually you might flee whether you lost one guy or half your guys. It's a little more consistent and a little more historical. So that's all we had for today. Please leave your comments in the comments section of my blog or on YouTube. Like I said, I'm kind of a rookie. I, you know, sort of like when you're uh, teaching piano lessons, you only have to be one lesson ahead of the kid. <laughs> so I'm just sharing what I know. If I made a mistake, please let me know. And if you like the video, hit like or, or just uh, make a comment so that I know there's people out there watching. Thanks a lot. Stay posted.